Here are some useful summation formulas for working with Riemann sums. We'll also get some more practice with sigma notation. First formula of the sum as i goes from 1 to n of the number r. So how does sigma notation work? We're going to start with a range of integers. So here it's going to start at 1, it's going to end at n. It's going to be 1, 2, 3, go all the way up to n. Then we have a variable that ranges over those integers. We call it i. In front of our sigma is going to be a function of i. So we take each of our integers, push it through the function, and then take the sum of the values. So here our function is going to be r. So no matter what you put in, an r comes out. So we're going to put a 1 in, an r comes out. Put a 2 in, an r comes out. Put n in, r comes out. And then we sum. So we're just going to take the sum of r with itself n times. So that's going to give me r times n. Next formula. Well, the sum is i goes from 1 to n of i. So for i, we put our number in. Our number comes right out. So here we're going to be taking the sum, 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way up through n. And then the formula is going to be n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Third formula of the sum as i goes from 1 to n of i squared. So that'll be 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, all the way up through n squared. It's going to give me n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6. Finally, we're going to have the sum as i goes from 1 to n of i cubed. So that's 1 cubed plus 2 cubed plus 3 cubed, all the way up through n cubed. It's going to give me n squared times n plus 1 squared divided by 4. Now, for most of the examples that we'll have working with Riemann sums, we'll see these first three, and then every once in a while we'll pull out number four. Now, let's take a closer look at formula one. For a concrete example, take the sum as i goes from one to four of the number two. How's our definition work here? Well, our range is gonna go from one to four, so we have the numbers one, two, three, four. We push them through the function two, so whatever goes in, a two comes out. So one goes to two, two goes to two, three goes to two, four goes to two. We sum the values, we get an eight. Since I have a one here, we can go to the formula. So n is equal to four, two is equal to r, we multiply, and then we get the eight as expected. Now, this seems like overkill. The point is, until you get used to the sigma notation, this can throw you off. So what happens is, you're presented with this, you'll take a look at the i, you'll go looking to see where your function of i is, and since we're using this constant function, i doesn't appear. So the idea is you just go back to your definition. Now, one other thing to note, okay, what would happen if, say, I had the range going from minus 1 to 1? So there my range is going to be minus 1, 0, 1. Okay. We're going to put each of those through the function 2, so I'll have 2 plus 2 plus 2, and I get a 6. So you don't need to have this formula floating around, okay, with the n up top. You can just go back and work things out by hand. Okay, this brings up another useful summation formula. If I take our function, multiply by a constant, and then sum, well, we could just save that constant for later after you sum your function. Okay, so it's what you would think you'd want to do. For instance, let's take the example we have on the board already. So if the sum as i goes from 1 to 4 of the function 2, I could pull the 2 out. That's going to leave me with a 1 here. And now I just apply our sum to the 1. So that means just take the 1, add it to itself 4 times. We get a 4. And then I multiply that by the 2. We get the 8 as expected. So again, seems like overkill. But the idea is we just want to get the point across. Next formula, we'll have the sum i goes from 1 to n of i. So it's just 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way up through n. Formula is going to be n times n plus 1 over 2. We check the special case, n equals 5. So I have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. It's going to give me 15. Then if we put it in the formula, we'll have 5 times 5 plus 1 over 2. So it's going to be 30 over 2, or 15. So that checks out. 
Now, to see this in general, we have Gauss's trick. So what we'll do is, we're gonna give our sum the name capital S, then we're gonna rewrite it in a different order. So we just write things in decreasing order. Now I'm just gonna add up the columns. On the left-hand side, I have two times S. Then as I go down each column, I get N plus one. Now, how many columns do we have? Well, if you know, they're labeled by, okay, the number that's in the column, so we have N columns. So if I add all these N plus ones up, we're gonna have N times N plus one, I divide by two, and then my sum is gonna be equal to n times n plus one divided by two. Okay, formula three. We have the sum as i goes from one to n of i squared. That's gonna be equal to one squared plus two squared plus three squared up through n squared. Formula is gonna be n times n plus one times two n plus one divided by six. Let's check that when n equals four. So we're looking at one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus four squared. So that'd be one plus four plus nine plus 16, gives me a 30. We put the four into the formula. We have four times five times nine over six. Then we work that out, you get a 30. So our formula checks out in that special case. Here's another summation rule we'll get a lot of mileage out of. If I take two functions f and g, we add them together. We take the sum over a given range of integers. The rule says you can work out the sum over your range over each function, figure out those answers, and then add them together. So this rule just says you could split up sums into separate summations. Now, let's take a look at a concrete example with the sum as so i goes from one to four of i plus two squared. Now by our definition, our range is gonna go from one to four. So it's one, two, three, four. We put each of these numbers into our function i plus two squared. So we'll get a three squared, a four squared, five squared, six squared. Add those up, we get an 86. Another way to get to our answer, I take our i plus two squared, we expand it. So it's gonna give me i squared plus four i plus four, I could use the rule we just obtained, split it up into three summations. So that'll give me the sum on i squared, a sum on 4i, and then a sum on 4. Now, for the sum on 4i, note from our previous rule, I could pull that 4 out in front. So what do we get here? Well, the sum on i squared, we're going from 1 to 4. So our n is equal to 4. So I have 4 times 4 plus 1 times two times four plus one, all divide by six. So that's gonna give me a 30. For our middle term, I could pull the four out. The sum as i goes from one to four of i, okay, that's gonna be four times four plus one divided by two. So that's gonna give me a 10, and then we multiply by four, so I get a 40. Then we have the sum as i goes from one to four of four. Now note the i doesn't show up, so we go back to our definition. Just gonna take the range one, two, three, four. Each of those is gonna give out a four, so we get a 16. Add up our three results, and then I get an 86, which agrees with the number we got using the definition. Now, how about formula number three? So, we're not gonna derive that, but if you're up for it, we'll do a proof by induction. So, how does an induction proof work? The idea here, we're gonna have some statement, and the way we think of it is, we're gonna climb a ladder. So how do you climb a ladder? You need two operations. First, you need to get on the ladder. Then once you know how to get on the ladder, you just need to know how to go from rung n to rung n plus one. So the idea would be, if I'm at rung number one, well, the n to n plus one rule it's gonna tell me how to go from one to two, then two to three, then three to four, then four to five, and so on and so on. So for any given statement n, we can get to that by just using this crank that lets me get from one rung to the next. Eventually I can get to rung n. So what do we do here? Our statement n is gonna be one squared plus two squared all the way up through n squared. It's equal to n times n plus one times two n plus one 
over 6. So we're going to prove a base case. So that's getting on the ladder. So that's n equal to 1. Now, if I put 1 on this side, that's just going to be 1 squared. If I put 1 on this side, I get 1 times 2 times 3 divided by 6, which gives me a 1. So we have for n equals 1, 1 is equal to 1. That's a true statement. So we're on the ladder. Now, for the induction step, what do we do? We're going to assume, okay, statement n is true. So that means we're assuming 1 squared plus 2 squared all the way up through n squared is equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6. What we want to show, assuming that's true, is that 1 squared plus 2 squared all the way up through n squared plus n plus 1 squared is equal to what's in our statement when we put an n plus 1 on the right hand side. So that would be n plus 1, n plus 1 plus 1, and then 2 n plus 1 plus 1 all over 6. So where we had an n here, we're now putting in an n plus 1. So I want to show that this statement's true. Well, what do we do? We write out our left-hand side, and then note, we already know what 1 squared plus 2 squared up through n squared is. Okay, we just substitute in what we're assuming. So we'll get this term here. So I get this term here, and then what's left over is going to be an n plus 1 squared. For my next step, I'm going to do two things at once. First, we're just going to multiply out our numerator here. Then I'm going to multiply out the n plus 1 squared. And then we'll multiply, okay, numerator and denominator by 6, just to get things over a common denominator. So I want a 6 here and a 6 here. When I do that, I can add things together, which gets me to here. And then you'll note, okay, well, to factor this out myself, that would take a little bit of work. So I can cheat. I already know what the answer is. I know I want to wind up with this expression here. So what I'll do is just work backwards. I'm going to take this. Okay, we're going to push through, okay, these parentheses. That gets me to this expression here. And then I'm just required to check my work that if I multiply out these three terms here, we get the numerator here. When you write it out, nobody can tell the difference. So since this works out, that's going to be our proof by induction. So we have base case, gets me on the ladder. We have the induction step, which tells you how to get the rung n to rung n plus 1. So I can get to any n that I want.